Cheers, Worcester. It's January the 23rd, 2018, and this is 508, a show about Worcester. I'm Mike Benedetti, and this is Brendan Milliken. Hi, Brendan. Hello, Mike. How are you? It's going great, and today we are going to be talking about economic development, music, stone quarries, and magic ninjas with... Tony Scavone of the Disc Jam Music Festival and more recently the Palladium. How's it going, Tony? Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? <laughs> it's going good. It's going good. Um, we are broadcasting on Worcester's Unity Radio. 0.000001 gigawatts of power on 102 FM. We are cable casting on WCCA TV 194. And we are podcasting at pieandcoffee.org. If you would like to call in, the number is 508 508- Four seven one five two six five, and a special shout out today to the mighty Hank Stoltz, who is engineering today's show. Thank you, Hank. Mike, why don't you wear your ear goggles? Uh, I'm I'm just totally disoriented. As okay. To what's going yeah. And whenever on I see you without those on, I wonder if you're even paying attention to me, or if I'm just here I'm, talking to myself. I'm in my own little world. Um, Tony, how's it going? It's going well. How are you guys doing? Uh, we're doing it. We're doing good. We're doing good. Brendan, do you want to? Uh, well, you know, Tony, why don't you tell us, uh, you introduce yourself a little bit, because I don't want to uh, cross streams on titles, and I, I'd love to start off just with you giving us the rough overview of uh, what you're up to these days. Sure. I'm Tony Scavone. I'm a uh, Worcester native, and most recently helping out at the Worcester Palladium after the renovations to help do some booking and marketing and promotions for the new uh, avenues that we're able to pursue after that, so... And what else do you do besides uh, the Palladium? You get some other other stuff going on as well. Yeah, I certainly do. I, I run and produce a music festival. Uh, it's the seventh annual uh, music festival. It's called Disc Jam Music Festival. It's a combination of live music, disc golf, camping, and arts. So I totally want to jump into the Palladium stuff, but sure. Disc Jam fascinates me because I, I didn't really disc golf is not my universe. I don't know why. I just never got into it. But we have a ton of disc golf in Worcester, like relative to other. We, we certainly do. In, in Worcester, in, in the surrounding towns, we have probably 20 different disc golf courses uh, in what? within a 20-mile radius of, of Central Mass. Okay. And one of them being uh, Maple Hill is pretty much the premier disc golf destination course in the country. So, and, and I, I totally knew that this was going on in the sense that like, I live over in the Tatnik area, so I know some of the, some of the uh, venues that are over in Leicester. There's obviously New, Newton uh, Square, Newton Hill. Yep. But last year, it was someone from Destination Wor- Worcester reached out to me to see if I wanted to sell ice cream at like a disc golf conference taking place at the DCU Center. That was at least pitched to me as being like huge relative to something that's probably kind of obscure in most people's mind. Right? Yeah, it's a niche sport that's growing tremendously um, if you if you look at it compared to some of the, you know, other, uh, you know, new sports like kayaking or like, you know, but it's competitive. People can actually make a living touring, playing disc golf now. And you're packing that into a music festival. and Yeah, correct. We wanted to be different with the, uh, the things that we were able to provide while the music wasn't going on. It's a four-day event, camping and hanging out and and getting to know people and bringing people together. And one of those things that I've been involved with that helped the community with the live music and and the event, it's been disc golf. I've met a lot of genuine good people out on Mm -hmm. the course and and thought that that would be a great element to provide an alternative to standing in front of a stage and sitting in front of a food vendor for, you know, multiple hours in a row and and opening up some some opportunity for people to express themselves in in a, you know, in the woods where you get to like meet people and, you know, hang out and it's not a hoity toity golf setting, like a, like a, you know, ball golf where you have to pay $80 mm-hmm. and wear a nice shirt and whatnot. You can kind of be yourself and, and enjoy yourself on the, in the course while you're enjoying nature. And, and if you have a competitive bone in your body, once you start to play, you, you, you challenge yourself. It's not that you compete against others. It's you compete against yourself and how you can do the next hole. And you just kind of you get this like energy that you're like, I want to do better. I want to try harder. And if you, know, if you can't do it, you laugh at yourself. But, so, <laughs> but then all of a sudden you get it. You're like, well, I can do this. Let me try and navigate this disc through these woods and whatnot. Because a lot of people don't know exactly how disc golf is, is laid out. You play in the middle of the woods. So this is a little bit like hiking and a little bit like tossing a frisbee. <laughs> it is. It's hiking with a purpose. I say that to people. And people <laughs> who hike get like angry when I tell them that, that it, hiking it doesn't have a purpose. But this is like a sport of hiking. Yeah. So, so before I'm, I have you put yeah. your uh, Worcester hat back on for a second, let, let sure. everyone that's listening know where Disc Jam happens and when. Okay. So Disc Jam started off in 2011 in Sturbridge. 
Um, we outgrew a couple different venues. We moved from Sturbridge to Brimfield to Barrie, Massachusetts. And most recently, we found our home in Steventown, New York. And when I say Steventown, New York, people go, I don't know where that is. I'm, I can't go all the way out there. But then I tell them that it's, it borders Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And they're like, oh, I know where oh, Pittsfield okay. is. Sorry. Okay, cool. So then, yeah, so I've gotten, I've convinced my friends to kind of, you know, be able to come and experience the show out in, in Steventown, New York. So that's where we are. And what, what are the dates? Uh, June 7th through the 10th. So it's a yeah. camping venue and... Yep, it's a fa- it's at a farm. It's at a beautiful, beautiful location, grass fields and um, wooded areas. And um, we let people camp out wherever they want. They set up their spots. They can camp next to their cars and, yeah. Okay, so again, we're putting the Worcester hat back on for a sure, second. Sure, sure. Why don't you talk a little bit about how you got brought into um, the Palladium? Because, you know... I, I feel like we kind of re- reconnected sometime after you came on board, and it was specifically because I just randomly hopped on the Palladium's website one day just to look to see what shows might be coming up. It's rare that the, in the past few years that I've found anything that really interested me down to the Same Palladium. With me. <laughs> and then it seems like over the last six months, I've been at the Palladium with my wife more in the last six months than I have in the last 10 years. Like the variety of shows is getting kind of crazy. And that was one of the things I really wanted to have you come up and talk about a little bit. And as I know you can't take credit for everything that's happening. None of us can. No. But there's something special that's happening where, you know, I'm not looking down at Lupo's in Rhode Island as much as I used to. And on top of that, the bathrooms and the Palladium might be some of the cleanest in the city of Worcester, which is huge when you're traveling with your wife. Um, it, it certainly is. And they haven't been in the past. They if have not been. That was the Palladium before. It was a very sticky situation. Yeah, it was not a of, selling point. In a lot of different d- directions. Um, so, yeah, I, I actually started to do what I do, is, which is promote and manage and book, you know, book art, artists and, and, and bands in, in the Worcester uh, scene at Tammany Hall, and that's where I got my my, my start with what I do uh, as a career and 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 my profession currently, and so I I took a I took a you know page out of a couple of other older promoters and watched how they treated the artists the way that they should have instead of being about themselves they were more about the artist and made sure that they were treated pro- professionally paid professionally uh, managed and promoted the right way. And I just kind of got the attention from some of the people at the Palladium after doing uh, a New Year's Eve event in 2014 there. And that's, this was prior to the renovations. Um, they allowed me to do New Year's at the Palladium, which is a big, it's a big night. You know, mm-hmm. It's a huge room. And we put a bunch of people in the room that night in, in a jam band setting, which is like the jam, funk, reggae, rock kind of setting, which is completely different from what they've been doing. They've been typically doing a, a metal kind of heavy rock uh, vibe at the sure. Palladium. So after they, you know, they did the renovations where they've, I don't know if you've, if you've Brendan's been there, but it's beautiful in there now. It's, it's incredible. It's really, really, really I ha- nice. I have not been in, the last time I went there was the last time I think Motorhead played there, so I probably haven't been in there if for five or six years. Even if you're just years. walking by someday, see if there's somebody there that can just let you poke your head in or something. Like, uh-huh. visually, the, the room is striking now, and it just, it makes sense. It's it's not that anything has changed. It's not like there's huge construction that's taken place, and there's a lot of updating and whatnot, but yeah. it's even when you're when you're there, be, the the lack of obstructions, the way they have a split level between seating and and general admission on the floor, it's like the ideal venue. And I had for, again, the last time I'd been there is probably 10, 15 years ago. I totally forgot, you know, what that looked like. And, and I think you, the more time you spend in other venues and you learn what makes sense for, uh, especially a live music venue, coming back into the Palladium, like wow, like we might have always had one of the absolute best mid-range, uh, you know, size-wise. Uh, live music venues right here under our nose the entire time. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying it was squandered on hardcore and heavy metal, but it's not really my scene. Uh, we should be thankful that in some capacity, that's one of the things Worcester's become known for is, you know, being like a, a hardcore sort of heavy metal scene. A lot of people travel here just for that, but it never really felt like it fully represented the diversity of music in Worcester from either on the local level up to just general interests. And now it's just, I mean, I think the last time I saw you was at the Action Bronson show about 10 minutes after I got thrown out of the uh, backstage area. Yeah, um, I brought you up there. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. It worked out well. <laughs> but so when it comes to the, the types of acts that you're looking to help bring in now, I mean, what are you folks targeting or what are you, what are you trying to change about the, the scope of, uh, of acts coming through? Well, typically when you you bring the palladium up to some of these, you know, marketing and promoters and uh, agencies, they they shun it. They or they did. And now after the renovations have been made and and we've test run it with some of the, you know, different subcultures that that are in the, the live music uh, uh, scene, 
they're now coming to us and trying to book bigger acts that they otherwise would have bringing to like House of Blues in Boston mm-hmm. or you know, some of the other venues in Providence like Lupo's or something like that. You so. guys have uh, Steve Aoki coming up soon, right? Yeah, huge that's, name, huge DJ. I mean, that's incredible. That, yeah. I mean, that's Legend. someone that normally you would see in Vegas or like you said, you know, uh, in Boston at, at an incredible at, at a huge venue. That and that's happening. What what's the date on that? I think that's coming up in February. I think it's the 25th. Uh, sold out, I'm sure. It's pretty close if it's yeah. not already. But we just had a sold out show with Ashanti and Ja Rule. So we can go, you know, hip hop superstars, like people you see on MTV, hear on the radio every day, uh, still current to people's, you know, playlists uh, coming through. You know? yeah, I mean, I, I, the second to last show I saw down there was uh, Flogging Molly and Anti Flag. And same thing, you know, it was a much. I was there on a Friday for an EDM show and then Sunday for Flogging Molly. And it went from being uh, <laughs> surrounded by a bunch of 20 year olds. Uh, to like me feeling like I might actually be kind of young uh, in the crowd on, on a Sunday night. But the, what was great to see as a Worcester guy, both nights downtown, that side, North North Main Street, downtown Worcester was jammed. Yeah. Uh, the Armsby Abbey, I'm told, had like an incredible weekend. Uh, Dead Horse was, was packed. Like the, the, the spillover effect is also huge in the sense that you have viable bars and restaurants that people are just making their home and camping themselves at the bar for a couple hours instead of standing in line. It actually feels like it's having an impact on the it's economic real. development it's of, yeah. of that whole. You side can actually of see it. It's palpable. People wonder, like, oh, you know, people say, you know, you know, the medical side of things is changing, is changing uh, Worcester's, you know, demographic for the future. The social side of things is, yeah. is changing along with it. It's you know, not only just you know, work environments now. People want to go out and, and and enjoy a meal and enjoy a concert and and explore the city again, which is refreshing. Are you guys finding a, a big split between uh, in demographics in terms of locals versus people coming in from out of town? It's it's about the same as what uh, what it would be in in Boston or Providence. It's people do travel here, but there are people that are like yourself, like myself, my family, my friends mm-hmm. have haven't been to the Palladium in a long time, and because of the you know the resurgence of the the the, the shows that are there, it's catching attention. So it's like oh I missed that show, but then they cruise through the schedule and say. Oh wow, wow, wow! There's three or four other shows that I'm, I would consider going to. So yeah, so the local side of things is is definitely stepping up, but it also is is garnishing some out, out of town attention as well. I want to I want to I gotta ask you something before we go to our sure. first commercial break. <laughs> I feel bad that we haven't already talked about this, which is the Juggalos. So the Palladium <laughs> and Worcester has long been like one of the regional capitals of the Juggalo movement, the Insane Clown Posse, all of those related acts. And so every once in a while, just suddenly downtown Worcester will be full of young people and older people with, you know, black and white clown makeup and that whole thing. Uh, I'm no fan. I mean, I'm not a fan of the Insane Clown Posse. I've interviewed Juggalos a bunch, and I've always had a really positive experience. I'm generally pro pro the Juggalo movement. Um, <laughs> how has that been going? We, we one of our first shows back after the renovations was the insane, insane clown posse and it was followed by guar okay and and the disco biscuits and they're three of the most wait this is this is one night or this, this is, is three no three different nights, nights and within a week when we very first opened back up in in uh, in October and they're the most diverse crowds <laughs> that you could possibly ask to have at a, at a, at a venue in three days and the insane clown posse has been one of the better draws at the Palladium for the last 10 years. They really have been, and they sure. they feel like they have are at home when they're there, and people get to, I guess, express themselves as juggalos on the streets of Worcester, and no one really minds that they're doing it. Like, they might not feel as embarrassed, <laughs> or they I don't, maybe they, they appreciate the attention or the lack thereof. I don't exactly understand it myself. It's a subculture that I'm not involved with, but they are devout in their fan base. They follow them religiously, and they show up in makeup and in and in almost costumes uh and these uh-huh. are the attendees not just the bands <laughs> sure sure absolutely absolutely and hey mike we got a uh, a caller lined up here oh, I'm, oh. I'm gonna hope it's not somebody that just wants to do uh distract from the show from like last week but we'll see how it goes. Hello, hello caller how are you you're listening to one old wait hello this is you're you're talking to 508 we can hear you 508 yeah, what's up yeah, hi, hey, caller. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh yeah, caller. Going? That's our motto. We can hear you. Hello? What? <laughs> Why, do we, <laughs> Why do we even take this call? Oh, it's just distracting the show. Hi, how's it going? We're just doing the distracting the hi, show. Hi, caller. Thanks. 
Tony, do you have anything to respond to that caller's uh, lack of a question? I'm on the radio. No, you just want to see Ellie's on the radio. That's awesome. It is awesome. (laughs) Nothing like a good feedback loop on FM radio. Oh, my goodness. This is 508, a show about Worcester. Are we ready to roll into our first break? We are. We'll be back in a minute. Right. Awesome. Thank you for that, Matt. If you want to stick around, you're more than welcome to. If you, uh... I'm, I'm down for a minute. I'm here. You got me. You got me out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Hank, anything you want to talk about in regards to Worcester uh, music in the city? You know what? I'm just kind of curious to bring up all those different acts. I mean, is it, is it different to do the sound? I mean, like, if you're doing it one night, is it a different way to do the sound? If you're doing water, sometimes I'm just kind of curious about, about that. Yeah. That was actually one of the things that... Um, so there's some cool stuff about the Palladium. We could say that, you know, the, the, the actual venue, the renovations that it's gone through, the seating upstairs is mm-hmm. like is like um, almost like IMAX seating on the yeah. front, the first, fi- first uh, five rows for VIP. The stage itself is is the Madison Square Garden basketball court. Oh, no, okay. okay. It's Throw the, some of that it's out the there. Hardware, yeah. It's the hardwood from the MSG after they did the renovations. Is it really? really? It's, it is. Oh, it's, this is sweet. You got to talk about it. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll jump into that if you want. Just open up the floor for you to throw it wherever you want. And then when we that... can plug electric haze, too. I haven't got yeah, to no, say no, anything that's... about that or whatnot. But, I mean, I... totally. I don't know. How are we doing so far, right? This is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, no, very interesting. This is going great. This cool. is going great. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the second so the second chunk is like an eight minute chunk and then we have another break. Okay. And then um, at some point I wanna read this thing about stone quarrying, the history of stone quarrying in Worcester. <laughs> but we're not gonna do that in the next eight minutes. We'll I'm, I'm, my my family grew up on stone quarrying. That's how I Well then I'm, then well, I'm it's the bone concrete my oh, right, construction yeah. company. That we had a we had a we had a sand and gravel co- uh, company that, that pretty much started the. Uh, oh, nice. Well, then I, totally, I don't want to. I totally want to. I totally want to read this on the show. I want to hear it at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the um, how did uh, Action Bronson like uh, BTS? It was a Sunday night. Oh, how, how do you like BTS? So oh, we loved, loved it. it. Yeah, he yeah, was in, okay. yeah, 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 he did. He definitely. We're did. ready to go back. Yep, yeah, we are. Okay. Hi there, Worcester. This is 508, a show about Worcester. I'm Mike Benedetti, and today on the show we have Brendan Melican. What's happening? Hi, Brendan. And Tony Scavone. Hello, hello. Tony, tell us some more about the Palladium. Just as a venue, like what, what are some of the things that people listening probably don't realize are going on inside that building? It's a gigantic room. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a cavernous room. It's a 2,500-person uh, general admission first floor Second floor of seated balcony, uh, built in the you know turn of the century. Um, you look at it when you drive by the by the city, and you don't really know exactly what's going on in that big brick building. But um, it's a lot of updates that it's gone through. You know, Brenda mentioned the the bathrooms being beautiful, granite countertops, you know, brass fixtures, uh, tiled floors. Um, the stage itself has been uh, replaced and. And, and with the Madison Square Garden basketball court, after they did their renovations uh, two years ago, it was in storage for a long time. The owners. So that's the actual basketball court for Madison Madison Square Garden. Thousands and thousands of, of basketball uh, uh, games have been played on that court. Yeah, and, and now it's at the Palladium. It's the stage. The wood on the stage is from Madison Square Garden in New York City. Yep. I, I'm now nervous that somebody's going to go in and start cutting chunks out of it after, <laughs> after hearing that. Or signing it or yeah. something, taking pictures with it. Yeah, why are you, signing, why are you, now, why are you talk, kissing the floor? It's weird, yeah. Talk about the, the split between the two levels. Because, again, one of those things that, you know, I'd played there a couple times uh, when I was involved with the local music scene, but that was – uh, the smaller room upstairs. It's now like the foyer area. It was... We still use that room as a stage. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. We certainly do. Yeah, we do. Two, we, sometimes you can do two shows. Uh, but yeah, the downstairs is a general admission, uh, five tiered, you mm-hmm. know, uh, elevation change. So you, wherever you see in the, wherever you sit in the room, you have a direct view at, yeah. the, at the show. No head, you know, heads are in your way. Besides when you're on the floor, but when you're on the floor. It's one of those you can get right up and close and personal with this with the uh, artist. You're you know five feet away from them singing to you. Ja Rule and Ashanti. Ja Rule was literally in the crowd singing to people, and they were like passing the microphone to people, mm-hmm. letting them sing the chorus and the and the and the and the hooks. Action Bronson was signing autographs of his cookbook, handing them out into the crowd. <laughs> I mean, it was it was so intimate while still being a huge. A seemingly huge venue. Exactly. Yeah. Now, that that two tier split. Like I was going to say was when I used to play there. Like I never even really thought about that second floor. I don't even know if I ever really knew it existed. Yeah. Um, for a while, it was it was kind of uh, 
condemned. Yep. <laughs> it had caution tape over sections of seats that were, you know, they, were, they weren't getting used. It was, you know, it definitely needed some some uh, attention. There was talks about it be- going under completely, and um, it, you know, it got the it got the money that it needed to to get the the resurgence it's had and. It's uh, really taken off. And that's, uh, you know, not knowing that was really up there as I've gotten older, and I hate to admit that, like I st- in my head I still uh, would rather be in a GA show on a floor. and whatnot. They usually last about 30 minutes or so before then you someone see. half my age has, you know, <laughs> hit me in the kidneys enough to make me realize I need to sit down. Um, but, like, in that upstairs seating is incredible because, like you were saying, the, the view doesn't change at all. It's – you still have – Yeah. if you're all the way in the back, you, you have still all, have an incredible view of the stage. It's amazing because as you go further up – you can't see any of the crowd below you. You just have this like almost like a you know TV screen picture right in front of you where it's perfect eye vision, eye eyesight, and you know it was obviously designed amazing back in the you know when it was when it was constructed. And so you'd mentioned in between the break there, and that that setup is designed to be something like an IMAX sort of setup where it is the field of view is is wide open and. Yep, they have the first five uh, sections of seating are VIP seats where they recline. You have two cup holders. You feel like you're in a, you know, like you're in a theater, your, your home theater kind of vision to it. And uh, even the even the seats as you uh, go up in the in the stadium seating in the in the balcony, cushions on your on your butt, cushions <laughs> on your back, uh, two cup holders on either side of you. And no twenty year olds hitting you in the kidneys accidentally. Yeah. No, you just have your wife maybe going to sleep or you know, yeah. place to put your jacket to stand up and dance and. So and we've, we've talked this jam, we've <laughs> talked the Palladium. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your back, some of the other stuff you do in the city. Sure. Um, I, I, my nine to five is 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 at Electric Haze, and it's a live music venue open uh, three four years ago on Milbury Street. Um, we we book a, a diverse lineup of type of events and music um, over there, mostly local and regional acts uh, that play original music. Mm-hmm. We try not to do the cover band thing too much. Um, we certainly cater towards the Grateful Dead and and the Fish vibe, the jam band scene. Um, because I think that's where you know a lot of the the culture of our t- type of demographic is based around. Um, and so yeah, a lot of the music that comes through there is either you know local, or regional from Central Mass or you know New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, you know Rhode Island. And Electric Haze did pretty much pick up that mantle, it seems, from uh, Tammany Hall. Correct. Right? Yes. Yeah. The, when Tammany closed, it was you know the, the the city was lacking for a spot to go. It was a staple in the New England jam band scene for for a long time. And uh, I kind of took what I was doing over there over to this new venue. It's beautiful in there. When you go inside there, people are like, I didn't ever expect this to be in Worcester too. It's a really swanky kind of vibe. It's uh you know a lot of art on the walls. You know uplighting and beautiful brickwork and hardwood floors and the bar tops beautiful and so bathrooms are by code so they've got big stalls and mm-hmm. hand, you know three or four sinks that are all beautiful in there as well so that's a that's a very cool room that I'm proud to be working at for the And as, as a music have. venue the, the first thing that struck me there is their sound is incredible for a re- relatively small space that's another thing that I always felt was somewhat lacking in the city was great sound in great rooms finally having combinations of the two yes uh, and and some of the other venues in the city have followed in suit with yeah. that you know uh, if, you, if you've been to the to the cove the cove mm-hmm. has definitely taken up that uh the same the same uh, mantra of, of having good sound brings people back because yeah. if you can't hear if it's too loud or if it's you know it's it's not a, an enjoyable experience so it's you know that's that comes into play big time Speaking of uh, sound, Hank, I think you had a you said you had a quick question about uh, oh, sound. Oh yeah, I mean, I, just I mean, it's a it's a great conversation. I guess I'm thinking a couple of things. One, you must now that you have so many new people coming back to the Palladium, you must get a lot of stories of people who are walking in who haven't been there in ten years or twenty years, have stories about EM lows or or bands that they that they saw there back in the day. Is is there some uh, folks that you're seeing all these different crowds, all these different people coming through the wall? Do they? Tell you some stories about the last time that they were there. <laughs> they certainly do. I, I have. I can remember many nights of driving downtown in high school. Mm-hmm. We used to just drive around this loop on Main Street, and then we would go to the Palladium for this yeah. like dance party. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, I'd see my friends, you know, from high school. This is twenty something, twenty five years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they come into the Palladium for these, you know, these rock shows and some of these, you know, other types of shows, and they're like. Wow, this place is so much different from what I remember being like a you know eighteen year old twenty year old kid driving around and coming to the dance nights that they had over there. And that's it. I mean, that's a challenging thing. Again, I don't want to blow too much smoke up your skirt here, but from a, from a booking perspective, 
I remember going to see the Eagles of Death Metal down in Lupo's. The last time I had been at Lupo's was to see G Love and Special Sauce, probably 23 years earlier. Um, just it, there wasn't much of a call for me to go to, but I love live music. Being able to book acts that are going to be able to draw in uh, not just a variety of audiences, but the age side of things too is huge. And it, I mean, it's a lot harder. I would assume it's a lot harder to get 40, 50, 60 somethings out into a live music venue. Uh, then it, it might be to get a 17, 18, 19 year old out to a live music venue. And the booking, it would seem, plays a huge role in that. Which it, again, it just seems like, I don't know why it wasn't so obvious in the past to really diversify on that front. I think the venue itself was, was a difficult sell to people to come to. The artists would choose a, a venue in Boston because it's, you mm-hmm. know, physically uh, and, uh, you know, a, a superior venue. And, you know, and the sound and the lights and all that have all got upgrades at the Palladium as well. It's gotten a, a complete makeover from top to bottom. It's got a digital marquee now outside where it has. Oh, that it looks sc- great. Have you it seen this? Great. Did you see oh, the marquee? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Mar- I mean, I feel like that's such a visual uh, as part of this downtown redevelopment. It's just such a visual marker of things that are happening. Yeah. Um, I think we got to go to another commercial break here, but we will be right back. This is 508, a show about Worcester. Awesome. Good stuff. So this next, so this next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about two two things going on this week in economic development policy, and read this thing about the quarry, and then interested to hear your take on both. Uh, yeah, just the way the downtown has changed. Yeah, I'll take I'll go. I'll go to to an end just because I want to hang out with you for a minute. Yeah, no, totally. Say thank you. That's kind of what um, I figured. This knowing some, this is where we always end up is you know uh, weird Twister stuff, like political stuff and whatnot. I mean. There's so much going on downtown that outside everyone thinks of apartments being built and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But that stuff doesn't matter if it happens in a vacuum, right? It's like all the other accessory stuff. It's the nightlife, yeah. the entertainment. It's like okay, yeah, we, you get someone who gets a nice job in Worcester. Yeah. For how long are they going to stay there? You want them to like, you know, not only are they like coming to live in an apartment, let's them move out to like Shrewsbury and buy a house and still stay working in there and be a part of the, I don't know, the, the resurgence of Worcester that is obviously you're happening. Yeah, no, and I feel like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we used to have this big debate about um, the, uh, that's perfect. <laughs> the, um, we used to always be debating whether or not Worcester could risk becoming a, uh, a bedroom community to Boston. Now I kind of feel like because we have all of the accessory stuff that matters, you know, dining, entertainment and whatnot, and a housing stock that's improving, that debate is nonsense. It's who cares if everyone's if people want to drive to Boston to work because they make more money, but then come back here to spend all their money. Let them. Yeah, that's Let them. what's the downside to that? Nothing. They're in Worcester. That's good. Yeah. We want to come back here in about, about, a, about a minute. Yeah, a minute. Okay. Okay. Anything else you want to jump in on that? No, all good. Right. All good. I mean, I just I am just kind of curious. I mean, is is it hard to do the sound? So if, if one night you're doing an insane clown posse, now I mean, now that you have all these different kind of acts. Do you set the the sound different? I mean, it's oh yeah, I mean it's for... it's you know, f- just like you have your mixing board here, yeah. they have a forty eight yeah. channel digital mixing console. But it's you know it depends on the room too. If you only have a five hundred person f- you know show at the at the bottom of the room, the, the sound be- bellows and echoes yeah, in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have t- you know twenty five hundred people in there, it absorbs some of the sound. But then you have the chatter of twenty five hundred people talking. So it, it's it's a difficult thing right. to, to be a sound engineer. No, I bet it's, it's not an easy. Because yeah. well, easy you, you talked about the importance of the sound and bringing people back. Yeah, it's not yeah. an easy room to mix. Yeah, oh, twenty seconds. Some music to be good. This is the water, and this is the well. <laughs> Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eye, and dark within. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eye, and dark within. This is also 508, a show about Worcester on Unity Radio in Worcester. I'm Mike Benedetti, today with Brendan Melligan. How's it going, Mike? And hey, Mike, Tom- I know yes. you got some stuff you want to jump into, but I, I just yes. wanted to point out to the audience that... so. That wasn't us that picked that fish track a minute ago. That was Hank that pulled it up. So, Hank, how many fish shows have you seen at the DCU Centrum Center over the years? When I, bef- when, for a short time, when I was Chris Carter at WEQX mm-hmm. for the, uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with WEQX out of, out of Vermont, but that was a station, anytime you're in Vermont and you're doing the live lunch, 
man, you're playing a lot of dead and you're playing a lot of fish and mm-hmm. you're playing a lot of jam bands, uh, band, bands up there. I've only seen them once. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was never a dead guy, but I was a huge fish. Uh, fan. I don't think I've ever missed a show at the DCU center centrum. And, uh, but the furthest I ever made it was actually uh, northern Maine, which that, there's a lot of stories that went along with that trip that would not be appropriate for radio at all. And I was probably there. Yeah, no, it was. Where was, was your one. show? Where did you see fish play? I saw I saw them in Vermont. Uh, I want to say that it was boy because I was with my daughters, and my daughters were were huge uh, fans. But there was another. I'm trying to think of the name. It's been driving me crazy. I'm trying to think of the name of the band. They just got back together and they they did like three or four sold out shows and. In New York City, I, I think when they hadn't been together for, uh, for for a bunch of years, and I can't think of who the heck they were, and they were huge in Vermont, and there was some kind of a of a festival, and I think it was in a mountain up in uh, up in Vermont when we were at the at the base of the uh, of the mountain, and they were like, you know, it was one of those all day sort of sort of things, and fish was the what was the big act. I'm trying to think about what year would it, this have been. I said it this, this would have been, oh man, uh, with my with my daughters yeah. in in Vermont, it would have been sometime. Sometime in the 90s, late, ni- no, it had to be like 2000, mid, mid, maybe mid-2000s, okay. something like that. that I'm mean, going to say fairly early. early. What was the uh, was Nectar, ne- that the, the album was? Nectar's, was ne- Picture of Nectar. Picture, yeah, that would have been the album. That, that Okay, so that would have been, uh, well, all the festivals were in Maine, generally in Maine. Yeah. Um, but they did do the one in... Uh, in Coventry, mm-hmm. Vermont, was that where it was? Yeah, that Coventry? might have been it. I mean, I remember that was the album that was out, that okay. picture of, of Nectar. Oh, this, this is earlier than that. Then. that yeah. yeah, I can't believe we're talking yeah, about the one, on I mean, the show. <laughs> well, the, the one you mentioned Maine again. You know, well, the one show that I saw a bunch of times. in northern Maine. I can't believe how long we drove to get there. And this venue looked like if you could picture a high school auditorium. It was like seating on both sides, but this, it was so big that like the ceiling had to peek down for a weird reason and. It it looked like the building was collapsing in on itself for a number of different reasons, but the uh, yeah, it was the most bizarre venue I've ever been in for a live music uh, concert, and yeah, it was one of Fish's regular stops. Incredible touring band. <laughs> I would I want to I'm I'm sort of jonesing, jonesing over here to talk a little bit about public policy, so I want to read some some agenda items real quick, and then we can go back to talking about fun things like like seeing bands. Um, there's a couple of public policy stories this week uh, around economic development in downtown Worcester. One of them is a item that is on the council agenda that councilors Rivera and Carlson have brought forth, which is the city manager be and is hereby requested to report to city council if there are any programs in place or being developed to assist both residential and business tenants, many minority businesses, at risk of displacement due to downtown development and share what staff member acts as the point person for any issues. A related story is that uh, Juan Gomez, who's the president of Centro, the uh, Latino organization in Worcester, who has uh, asked the Worcester Redevelopment Authority to to consider expanding the downtown urban revitalization plan area to include uh, part of Maine South. Right now it sort of is in downtown and it stops uh, stops before it hits... um, Chandler Street, and then it kind of loops around uh, south of Southbridge Street. Uh, and I find both of these stories, these, I find as, as sort of you know mundane as these are, like if somebody had told me 10 years ago there would be concerns around uh, down the negative effects of so much downtown development in Worcester, I wouldn't believe it, Brendan. It would be like you were telling me, you know, Mike, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to get, get kind of ripped. You know, uh, I'm probably also going to become like 100 feet tall, and I would just be like, okay, Brendan, fine, fine, whatever. No, this is a problem for me. And then suddenly, 10 years later, you're 100 feet tall, and I'm like, now I have to consider the foundation on my house shifting. Like, there's all these weird issues that would have seemed like science fiction 10 years ago. Yeah, no, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, too, where, and I think we both mostly agree on this one, too, that we're probably a little bit early to be having full, full-blown full gentrification conversations in the city, that, you know, as things change and development heads in a certain direction— uh, you, you got a, a block of time before you really get to the point where you're talking about gentrification, uh, as most people would think of it, you know, LA in the late eighties, early nineties, Philadelphia yeah, over the last decade. Yeah. But what you're mentioning, I think what, uh, Councilor Rivera's concern is that seems to be something a little bit more real and something a little bit more palpable that, yeah, I mean, you know, a landlord, uh, puts in a, a bunch of cash into renovating a building, uh, that money has to come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. It's likely going to come from tenants and, those tenants might have been running a business at scale that was much smaller than 
a lot of the city wants things to be heading in a really short period of time. Right. And and again, I don't know if that truly fits into the gentrification box. I guess loosely it does. I think it but... loosely does. And I think that that I mean that is a that is a legit uh, concern, right? Which is that like I mean the re- totally a, a lot of yeah. a lot of people rent downtown because you can rent cheap places. There's bad buildings and there's mm-hmm. bad neighborhoods or neighborhoods where there's not a lot of traffic. And if you can run a business in that situation, more power to you. And then, like you said, suddenly, like your building is in better shape and there's more people around, so it's more desirable and the rent goes up. And maybe your business is not a business that benefits from those things. Yeah, no, which I think there are going to be a fair number of businesses downtown that unfortunately are going to get caught up in in those changes. It'll be interesting to see where that conversation leads to. I have a funny feeling I... I can think of where it ends up in City Hall from a conversational perspective, but uh, out on the street, I guess it doesn't really help like, to not know. You, you mean you mean in far as like seeing like how do you actually like how would the city actually help with this? Well, you know, just... we actually do have some folks that work in economic development that that's I mean they do business retention and they do a really good job of it. They've been doing it for years. You know, mm-hmm. if if a building is being uh, changed over in terms of ownership, we've got a lot of business owners in the city that don't carry leases, right? It's just it go go they're at will. Right. Um, we've got a a team up at in City Hall that handle, handles business retention and part of that is looking for new footprints for people to slide into. So you're answering the question of this agenda item right now on the radio, which is if you're a downtown uh, business owner and you're having concerns about what happens if my rent suddenly gets jacked up what do I do you call City Hall you say I got to talk to business retention I got to business retain me but something tells me at the same time that a lot of that retention work is being dedicated to towards larger corporations that right. have a, a larger number of employees that are going to steal focus uh, having somebody that's working in the same capacity that's just trying to ensure that there is some place for people to go if their current location isn't a, a good long-term fit uh, that's probably not the worst thing to have either. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that the one high-profile uh, business that people have been talking about in regards to this is a barber shop. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure that the city is, like, much more excited about cancer hospitals and big insurance companies than a barber shop. But, but similar these to what, are both big parts of what goes on in the city. Well, it's huge. I mean, and similar to what we've been talking about on the entertainment side of things, too. I mean, it, it, I think it is very easy to discount things that might not impact your life on a daily basis, like a, a cancer center uh, that's going to bring in a couple thousand employees or, or whatnot. That, that's, that's a really sexy thing for the city to get attracted uh, by. But the reality is that, you know, the, I think the real uh, day-to-day interests revolve more around places like that's entertainment, the Palladium, uh, new bars and restaurants that are opening up in the city. Um, mm-hmm. They might not carry the same weight from a, a you know an immediate financial perspective, but the bodies they draw into the city is there. There is no other industry that compares to our even relatively small entertainment industry in the city. Yeah, and and you know people often talk about Hartford as an example of a city where you know they they roll the sidewalks at five o'clock. You got the big you got the big insurance companies and people come downtown and work and then they go home. They mm-hmm. go far far away, and that that's not a healthy way to have a city. No, and you know, you, you mentioned you know, I, I went on a bit of a tangent there, but the barbershop thing is kind of huge. It's I remember as a kid, you know, barbershops were still in you know through the late '80s were still the place that everybody met on you know Saturday and hung out like generationally, right? Like you'd go in with your dad or something, yeah, and yeah. you'd meet all of his friends and all of his friends' kids and whatnot. It was it, it was one of those like third place kind of kind of venues. Then in the late '90s through the early aughts, it seemed like that classic style of barbershop disappeared for the most part. And now they're coming back everywhere. And I personally love to see barbershops that like reflect, you know, a neighborhood's wants and interests and whatnot, where there are just going to be a big collection of people hanging out. Having one just pick up and leave downtown, like it, it, it kind of is ignoring the fact that there are people still living there who might not be newcomers to the city. That's true. That's true. I want to, uh, Tony, I want to get back and talk about the Palladium and talk about economic development and talk about all this stuff. But first, I want to read, I'm going to do one more nerd thing, um, which is I want to read this. This is something that Colin Novick and I put together about uh, the old stone quarry that used to be in Green Hill Park. This isn't just a quarry. This is the quarry. The early buildings the European settlers built in Worcester had foundations of stone cut from the exposed granite deposits on Millstone Hill, which is the hill north of Bell Pond, south of Green Hill Pond. Considering that they settled first at Lincoln Plaza, then at Lincoln Square, the location couldn't have been better. They just had to move the stone downhill and not all that far. In 1733, the city declared, quote, that 100 acres of the poorest land of Millstone Hill be left common for the use of the town for building stones. The city took control of the land in a weird way where it wasn't clear if the city was giving itself the land or just quarry rights to the land. So as the public quarried granite on a DIY basis, the quarry was sold and resold, 
in the early 1800s coming under control of the Green family, who owned so much nearby land. Amidst lawsuits and more lawsuits, a judge said the public still had the right to use town quarry. And the custom was that you would clear an area free of trees and dirt, quarry your granite, and then sell your cleared area to someone else, a lot like the modern Western tradition of clearing a parking spot after a snowstorm, then reserving it by leaving a chair in the street. In 1873, Worcester granite magnate George D. Webb began his empire by, with Charles F. Batchelder, mining granite commercially from nearby green-owned land. He went on to buy other bigger quarries in New Hampshire and Massachusetts and to build a granite-cutting factory below Millstone Hill on Crescent Street. All through this period, huge chunks of, st huge chunks of the city were built with and on stone from Millstone Hill. In 1905, the Greens had sold the quarry and surrounding land to the city for use as a park, and eventually the quarry became disused, and local kids now felt safe to swim in the rainwater accumulated in the 35-foot deep pits, daring each other to dive off the cliff walls. Other locals began dumping garbage in the quarry, eventually putting an end to the swimming. In the 1960s, Worcester redeveloped its downtown. We've mentioned this before. We'll mention this many more times on the show, the, the pre-RICO re redevelopment. Uh, tearing down its historic buildings and derelict houses, carting them up Millstone Hill, and dumping the debris into the quarry and burning it. Finally, in 1968, the State Department of Public Health shut this operation down. The city reopened the site on November the 9th, 1971, as an ordinary sanitary landfill. Members of the newly formed Regional Environmental Council then sued the city to close it, cementing their commitment to aggressive action. This was a very controversial move, and the first REC president or REC chairman resigned because he was opposed to suing the city over this. Eventually, the REC won, and in 1973, the landfill was closed. For the next several decades, the city avoided implementing the official 1972 plan to turn the landfill into a recreational space, instead continually coming up with plans to reopen it as a dump, plans that were each time foiled by citizen opposition. And then finally, in the late 1990s, the city agreed the landfill would never be reopened, and the city eventually capped it and turned it into the present Green Hill Park ball field. When you're up there, you could think of yourself as being atop a giant pile of trees and mattresses, but it might be even more apt and pleasant to imagine yourself atop a giant pile of ornate demolished buildings, many built in part from granite mined at that very spot. Mike, could you, for a minute, thank yes. you for that, because I wasn't yes. sure where that was going, but where that ended, yes. that's exactly where I needed to be. I, I've been telling you for years now, that uh, I think one of the things Worcester needs is ridiculous uh, destination entertainment. I think I've mentioned you in the past my idea for the world's largest water slide going into Coe's Pond over on Mill Street. Sure, of course. I also have uh, I, I, I have the idea for a um, what is uh, not, rope swings not the word. What, what am I looking for here? The zipline um, zip zip line line. running from Worcester Airport to City Hall. Monorail. <laughs> yeah. Monorail. No, well, J pods are, right? are ahead of the monorail game, but. Could you imagine if we actually had a giant open stone quarry in Green Hill Park that you could, like, I... Uh, I, I can imagine a lot of tragedy coming no, out of No, but that. I mean, there's a couple places in Vermont that uh, that I, I, I fancy every once in a while that, um, uh, you know, that are all granite uh, quarries. And right. it's incredible when you see, like, an entire community coming around, diving off the sides of open quarries. And as like, long as they're kind of kept relatively clean, uh -huh. could you imagine the, the, tr the traffic that we would have coming into Worcester just have to go, go to cliff... Have you been to Pond up the hill? Have you seen... The... Is that... What, what is this? Would that be an example of that? Well, no. I, well, maybe. Yeah, no, I guess it could, it could get weird, but it would also be pretty awesome if you had this, this <laughs> destination in the city that was, oh, yeah, we're going to go cliff we're gonna go cliff diving in Worcester. It's That's something that's so far off the city's radar, but here we did. We, so we, this, is your, this is your proposal, which is that we should re-excavate uh, Green Hill just, Park. I Everyone gets a uh, metal detector. <laughs> We can <laughs> we can work on re-excavation, but I think first we need to tackle the zip line and uh, the water slide. Those are the two things that I, I think are, are just definite home runs. I mean, again, a, a, the world's largest water slide in of Worcester. Course, of people, course. People would pay $20 bucks for that. Idea. And, you know, Amen. if you came in to, uh, from a flight uh, at Worcester Airport for business, you know, what, where JetBlue's starting with, uh, you know, the, the business flights from New York soon. So you fly into to, to Worcester to do business with the Worcester Chamber of Commerce or something. You water slide right down? Yeah. No, no, this no, is, that's line. a zip line. Oh, so zip, your, sorry, sorry. your luggage to the zip you you don't call an Uber to come pick you up. You, they just clip you right into a, a harness and just right down to, to City Hall. And you get to see the entire city on the way. It's 10 bucks. and It'll be cheaper than an Uber ride. And I'll have to make a fortune. Uh, this, this sounds amazing. This sounds amazing. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know where to go from there. No, well, you do know where to go. That, that's, you know, the, the, the thing is, 
uh, the, the quarrying that was done here, mm-hmm. I, I think about this, no joke, I think about this every time I'm walking around Home Depot or something like that. When you look at like building material, these, these giant monolithic buildings that we have now for building materials, when you take a step back and you look at like plywood, right? And it's always spray painted on the side where it came from, like, yeah. wherever in the world or yeah. whatever. Um, imagine if like you st- we still only built with what was locally available. Like, you know, if you're building a house in Worcester now, you're building with plywood from Sarasota, you're building, you know, with drywall that probably came in from overseas. Sure. None of your building materials come from the area itself. Like, we actually built this city on stuff. Really. I live in a house that uh, has a fieldstone foundation, right? It's mm. like that any house that's 100 years old or older, that that's what it's going to have. It was materials that were just kind of you, you dug a hole. I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of rocks here. We're gonna use that to to build out a foundation. That's it, what you read. is just fascinating to me. That I think it's easy to lose sight of of how regional and how local we were when it came to construction. And you now it's not there's no, anything wrong with Sarasota plywood, but you know. Let's let's go to our final commercial break, and then we will come back and talk to Tony some more about this. No more plywood. This is 508, a show about Worcester. We'll be right back. I thought you were gonna say the city was built on rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> we could have gone that way. <laughs> You'd be down with a zip line ride from Worcester Airport. So yes, yeah. I'd be I'd be down to help check people in and send them on their way. <laughs> you wouldn't on that thing. I would not go on that uh, on that thing. That would so, not be my thing. Where does the world's largest water slide run exactly? Coast Pond. Uh, no, it just goes to Coast Pond. Coast Pond. Okay. So the, from the from Airport Hill, right? No, well, you could. I think it just goes high. Like the thing that I've always thought was, what's his name? The guy who owns. Uh, he calls himself Samuel Adams now. The guy who owns the property. Um, uh, the big old Big D property on Mill Street. Oh, I, uh, and so yeah, he, he actually, that? So that's that's the mystery. Okay, it, yeah. it was a family that owned it. The guy, the the son who inherited it, owes millions to people. Like it, it, he's been in debt for for ages now. So he changed his name legally to Samuel Adams to go dark. Like he popped back up like two or three years Remember ago. Remember, we're recording this. Well, yeah. Now okay. he popped back up a, a couple of years ago and was starting to talk about oh, doing okay. renovation that's on the the property. And um, but then he vanished again, and I don't think anything's happened. The property's just sat derelict now for for quite some time. But that's what I thought would be perfect there, because you demo that building. Now you've got this giant parking lot that you can actually bring people in for the world's largest water slide. And uh, yeah, you know, it would start over across the street. You got that whole hillside that goes up towards the airport, um, I heading need to towards. See, I need to see a map. First to Second Street. I thought that you were going to start way up there, like I almost think, zip line long. I don't know what the engineering uh, <laughs> challenges behind a water slide are. I don't know. I don't know what the, the load of uh, a fiberglass can handle, but I think we can go big. And you know, we have that one thing: the world's largest water slide. Are we ready to start doing the show again? We have just one minute, and then we'll uh, we'll be right back. Oh, we've got one more PSA. So, what are you going to ask me? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was just curious. You were just, I mean, you know, I don't know. Like, uh, we just made you sit there and listen to an essay for 15 minutes. I'm just curious to know, like, any thoughts that spring to mind. Oh, don't give me that one. <laughs> you were saying, saying your family had been in the stone business? The construction, construction company, yeah. Construction. So they, they helped, you know, build 290, 395 from the, you know, like the, the asphalt up. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you know. Eons ago, decades ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Hey, how long is this one? You will have uh, seven minutes. Is this the last one as well? And this is it. Yeah. Do you have an agenda for this last seven minutes? Hmm? Do you have an agenda for this last seven minutes? No. Okay. Okay. And we are ready anytime you are. I'm good at chilling again. You are listening to 508, a show about Worcester. Worcester's Libertarian Voice on 102.9 FM in Worcester, WCCA TV 194, and podcasting at pieandcoffee.org. Today we've been talking to Tony Scavone of disc golf festivals, music festivals, music venues, the Palladium. Um, I guess I just wanted to read that thing about the granite quarry because it made me think about public... You know, uh, lo- local government control over economic things and when times when that works well and times when that doesn't work well. Again, just thinking about like, you know, gentrification downtown and managing development sure. downtown. So much of it, I guess probably we got into that situation because of redevelopment in the 60s and putting together giant parcels of land with difficult to renovate buildings. And we're getting out of it now with the WRA coming in and the city manager coming in and all these people with actual money from out of town coming in and trying to deal with money. And then we're saying, well, now how do we deal with uh, the negative effects of this economic development? 
Yeah, totally. A, a, again, a justifiable concern, and it's it, it's still a, a gamble as well because you you know when you think about it, all of the, the the work that was done downtown previous generation, like what led to the Galleria, the original mall that was down yeah. there, yeah, that was celebrated not just around here but nationally sure. for like a great example of uh, malls were were immensely popular at the time. The idea of of, of shutting down street level uh, retail made sense, uh, and having central shopping districts made made more sense to people. Um, and then the, the, the construction and work itself w- was, you know, we had people coming in on the federal level to, to, to tour and view the project simply because it was done on time, you know, under bu- those classic on time under budget, uh, you know, yeah. catchphrases we yeah. hear from politicians. It actually was. And it was viewed nationally as like this, this is what uh, cities should be doing to, to, to right their ships and whatnot as, as economies and interests change. But that didn't last. And, you know, we could be doing everything that we're doing downtown now and, you know, 20 years from now. So, oh, what were Why we would you ever do that? Why would you ever build a cancer hospital? <laughs> Didn't they realize cancer was going to be cured by this one iPhone app like 18 months after that hospital <laughs> was built? Scared you a bit now. But, you know, <laughs> at the same time, I, I finally do feel uh, as a life around here that we have picked a more uh, viable, at least long term direction, you know, focusing on housing, getting people back, living back downtown, letting that sort of energy spread to other neighborhoods. There are plenty of concerns to be had when it comes to uh, negative effects of gentrification and whatnot. But at the same time, uh, if there is anything to be said for rising tides, and another sort of catchphrase, like that's going to be where it's at, right? I mean, the, you know, we've we've languished for years in terms of property values being low. We've been kicked around for years from the rest of the region for uh, – not having the sort of attractions that uh, the second largest city in New England uh, should have to draw people in. And I mean, just the conversation we're having here with you, it's, you know, the, Tony, the, the, the number of people that I'm sure the Palladium is bringing in or Electric Haze uh, to the city and reintroducing it to them. Because I, I always, you know, looked at when you met somebody that was going to talk down about Worcester, they're going to say, well, what, 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 what's so wrong with Worcester? And they said, well, I was at the Palladium 10 years ago. And oh, come on, like, you know, it, like nothing ever changes. Like we've been in stasis. But I think we actually have been for so long that we're actually getting to the point where we're realizing that updating both the visual, but then the experience itself, everything starts coming together. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the Palladium is playing a huge role in that. Uh, the, the restaurants uh, downtown are playing a huge role in that. Uh, and the housing is an incredible component of ensuring that we have housing stock that actually represents what people, especially young people, want today. Tony, I'm, I'm just curious to ask you, like, as someone who's connected with a downtown business, I mean, do you see – Brendan was just asking about, you know, seeing locals versus out-of-towners. I mean, do you feel like you see – I don't, maybe you don't even have a sense of exactly where people are coming from. I just think about like all the foot traffic that's been in, that's been uh, built up by putting the pharmacy school downtown, by putting all the student housing downtown. Like, do you feel like these kids are also like going to shows because they, they're like, oh, it's they, two blocks away, we might as they well. They are. Go. You see the college kids down there. The college schools are, are a big influence for you know, where people go to school. They want to see if, if there's a place to go out at night. You know, not only do they want to, you know go to school they want to enjoy themselves as a, oh, totally. as, as, as an adolescent or growing up in, in, a, in a city environment where they might be from a town you know in Connecticut or something like mm-hmm. that they want to live in a city but they want to be in a safe environment while they while they grow up and, and go through their schooling and sometimes I think that's an influence on where people decide to go to school is, is there is there outlets outside of the school? That's one thing that I think will it continues to be and I hope it changes soon a fair criticism of the city is we call ourselves and consider ourselves a college town. But when you actually take a step back and get out of your local shoes for for a bit and try and view the city through the lens of somebody who's just visiting, you know, has four years to decide whether or not, hey, maybe I want to make this home or what. We are nothing like a college town. You know, we still, a fair number of our our, our restaurants uh, and venues aren't even open all week. They'll close on Mondays, maybe Tuesdays, which is, you know, I, I make sense, I think, from an ownership, maybe a family perspective, but gets a little dicey from a consumer perspective when people don't even know what's open. We have early closing hours that don't represent what you would see in a, in a, in a college neighborhood, which is one of the things that makes me so happy about the, the changes on the service industry side, the growth we've seen there. And again, the growth that we're seeing on the, uh, the entertainment side, because that's the hook, you know, all you got to do is show somebody one great experience in a city like Worcester and it changes their perspective overall. It's infectious. Totally. 
Tony, uh, Tony, I'm so happy you came on the show today. Thanks for this having is me. So, I'm so pumped to go to a show at the Palladium now. I, I just feel like I want to go almost more to see the Palladium than whatever made it. So when is Insane Clown Velocity? Tony, that's what we're bringing back. coming back. They're coming back. Uh, it's March, right? Yeah, March. it is. It's into, into the we're going to have to get tickets for that one. That sounds we're fantastic. We're going to pick you up. That sounds fantastic. Well, everybody, this has been 508. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>